Welcome, a very warm greetings to you all. Thank you for joining us again for another Pariyathi Presents event. My name is Briha Sarathi, and I'm here on behalf of Pariyathi as its Executive Director. We're grateful that you've all joined us today. For those of you who are not already familiar with Pariyathi, we're a nonprofit charitable organization based in the USA. Our mission is to enrich the world by disseminating the words of the Buddha, providing sustenance for the seeker's journey, and illuminating the meditator's path. Pariyathi imports books from around the world, reprints books, publishes new titles, and converts existing material into digital formats. We protect and provide an enormous catalog of Dhamma resources in many languages and formats that otherwise would not be as easily available. We offer many free services such as the Pariyathi Learning Center, the Treasures of Pariyathi, Dhamma Storytime, and Daily Words for Inspiration via email, RSS feeds, and our mobile app. We offer most audio and video material, as well as many ebooks and audiobooks free of charge, including a large number of resources for students at SN Goenka. We also organize donation based residential Pali workshops and facilitate pilgrimages for Vipassana meditators. For more information on Pariyati, please visit our website at pariyati.org. So, for today's event, Corey Goldberg interviews Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi. Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi is an American Buddhist monk originally from New York City. He holds a B.A. in philosophy from Brooklyn College in 1966 and a Ph.D. in philosophy from Claremont Graduate University in 1972. He received novice ordination in Sri Lanka in 1972 and full ordination in 1973. He was formerly the editor and president of the Buddhist Publication Society in Kandy, Sri Lanka. He returned to the USA in 2002 and now resides at the Chongyan Monastery. Since 2013, he has been the president of the Buddhist Association of the United States. He is a prolific translator of the Pali Canon, which is the most ancient collection of Buddhist scriptures. And he's also the founder of the organization called Buddhist Global Relief, which funds projects to fight hunger and to empower women across the world. So Venerable Bodhi will be interviewed by Corey Goldberg. Corey has a PhD in religious studies from the University of Quebec in Montreal and teaches ethics, critical thinking, religion, and sustainability at Champlain College in St. Lambert, Quebec. He co-authored Along the Path, The Meditator's Guide to Pilgrimage in the Buddha's Land, and is a general editor of the Pariyati Journal, as well as a Vipassana meditator in the tradition of Sayadri Bakken as taught by S. N. Goenka. So without further ado, I give you a venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi and Corey Goldberg. Thank you, Bhante. It's, it's a privilege and an honor to be speaking with you today. So I'm curious, how did a, a Jewish guy from New York become a Buddhist monk in Sri Lanka, hmm. dedicating his life to translating the words of the Buddha? Okay, that's quite a long story, but... <laughs> a short version. <laughs> okay. Initially, I became somewhat interested in Buddhism when I was in my junior year in college. I, I went to Brooklyn College. And just browsing in the bookshop, I saw some books on Buddhism, and then out of curiosity, I picked them up, and that sort of stimulated my interest even more. And during my last two years of college, then I just did reading on Buddhism, but there was no real knowledge at that time of how to practice the Dharma, especially about practicing meditation. Actually, a few times I had tried to do meditation on my own, thinking that as soon as you sit and cross your legs and focus on the breath, that you immediately go into samadhi. Uh And it didn't quite work for me that way. (laughs) And so then after a few sessions, I gave up on it. But then I went, this was, let's see, 1966. Then I went to graduate school in California, uh, Claremont Graduate University. And I was a major in philosophy. It was Western philosophy. And in the second semester that I was at at Claremont, a Buddhist monk from Vietnam came to study at the same university. And he also came to reside in the same residence hall where I was living. And so I became friendly with him and I took him as sort of my first teacher and guide to Buddhist practice. And he introduced me to Buddhist meditate, to the practice of meditation and After some time, I actually became a novice monk under him, a novice in the Vietnamese Mahayana system. Mm -hmm. But he encouraged me, you see, at at that time in Vietnam, amongst the younger generation of monks, there was a renewed interest in looking at the early sources of Buddhist teachings. Mm 
I think Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh was another example of this, sort of going back past the Mahayana Sutras to the Agamas and then to the Pali Nikayas. And so my Vietnamese teacher encouraged me to go to Sri Lanka. And after he returned to Vietnam during my last year in graduate school, I met several monks from Sri Lanka who were passing through the Los Angeles area. And I became friendly with one of them named the Venerable Piyadasi Mahatera. And he suggested that he said to me when we parted, he said, someday you should come to Sri Lanka and I could arrange for you to stay in a Buddhist monastery. And so when I finished with my graduate studies, then I decided that I wanted to go to Sri Lanka to become a Theravada monk. And so I wrote to Venerable Piyadasi, and then he connected me to an elder Sri Lankan monk named the Venerable Balangoda Ananda Maitreya. And so I wrote to the Venerable Ananda Maitreya asking if I could come to ordain under him and stay at his monastery. And then he replied, welcoming me. And so this was now in, see, in August 1972, I left the United States. I went first to Thailand for one week. Then I went to Vietnam to visit my first teacher. And this was in the midst of the Vietnam War. And I spent about two months in Vietnam. And then from Vietnam, I went to Sri Lanka, arriving at the end of October, 1972. Wow, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Did you ever feel threatened when you were in Vietnam during the war as a, as a Western Buddhist monk? Or did you feel secure? It's an interesting question because I used to like take walks around the street in the neighborhood and I was wearing the brown robe of the Vietnamese monk. <laughs> and I would just sort of take these leisurely relaxed walks around the neighborhood. And then when I look back at that years later, I think, wow, that was foolish of me. <laughs> I could have been kidnapped <laughs> and held for ransom. <laughs> Maybe well, we're was, lucky you weren't. <laughs> maybe I was a rather naive young man then, <laughs> thinking that everything is hunky-dory with the world, even though there's a bitter war going on. Maybe you had some protective devas hovering over you. <laughs> maybe. So your, your voice is one of the most prolific in the English world of Pali Buddhism. You translated or co-translated several texts, major texts, like the Majjhima Nikaya, the Anguttara Nikaya, the Samyutta Nikaya, uh, the Sutta Nipata, all wonderful works. And you've also put together really wonderful anthologies, such as the words of the Buddha and the Buddha's teaching on social and communal harmony. So what challenges do you face when translating an ancient language and culture into modern English? Well, first, I think I had, working in Sri Lanka, I had sort of good models to emulate. So when I was learning Pali, you see, first let me explain how I came to be a translator. It was not my original intention when I went to Sri Lanka and became a monk. It was in no way my intention to become a translator. But I did want to be able to read the canonical texts in the Pali language. And so when I came to stay with Venerable Ananda Maitreya at his temple in Balangoda, I studied Pali under him. And then I would be reading the English translations from the Pali Text Society. And the problem I faced was that I couldn't understand them. <laughs> they were in English, but they were composed in a kind of artificially stilted language, almost imitating the style of the King James Version of the Bible. And so I learned Pali myself, and I would rely upon the translations by Venerable Jnana Moli, Venerable Jnana Ponika, Venerable Jnana Tiloka, and that helped me to build up a kind of vocabulary of fairly adequate English, trans uh, English translations of the key Pali doctrinal terms. And so in that way, slowly and gradually, I started to translate texts for myself in order to be able to understand them in the original language. And I, again, I had no intention of becoming a translator. 
But from time to time, I would go to stay with the German monk, the elder German monk, the Venerable Nyanaponika Mahatera. And I would sometimes have like questions about passages in the texts. And I would show him what I was working on and show him the blanks in my translation. And he saw what I was doing and he was very pleased with my translations. And he encouraged me to go further with translation. And then when I stayed for a long time with him, he gave me notebooks that he had compiled in the late 1940s in which he had translated substantial passages from the Pali commentaries into English selections, particularly from the Diga Nikaya commentary, some passages, I think, from the Majjhima Nikaya commentary. And so looking at Venerable Nyanaponika's translations and the original Pali text, then I was able to pick up the style of the commentaries and then go even went further into the sub commentaries. Um, so in that way, I got sort of familiar with the, you know, the style of the text, both the canonical text and the commentarial language. Mm -hmm. And were there any challenges do in this translation I process? Think, yeah, a big challenge in translating from Pali is that Pali, even the canonical texts use many like, technical terms for which we don't really have adequate count counterparts in English. And so the early translators had to construct or develop a kind of artificial English language to render the Pali technical terms. And so that became what is sometimes called hy was it? hybrid Buddhist English. <laughs> yeah, and so, you know, the counterpart of hybrid Buddha Sanskrit, yeah. <laughs> Buddha's hybrid Sanskrit, Buddha's hybrid English. Yeah, yeah. Um, Great. Yeah, and so I had to, well, I drew on the kind of vocabulary of technical language that had already been developed by earlier translators. And so in a way, the canonical texts were not so much a challenge, except a good, to get a good style. And of course, the diction is different, the syntax is different. And so one has to make choices about whether one is going to adhere fairly closely to the diction, the syntax of the canonical text, or to take the liberties of putting it more freely into English. And I decided to try to take a middle way using a kind of partly elevated English not trying to put it into too vernacular, too colloquial English, because I believe that the Buddha would have spoken in a somewhat, though he was addressing ordinary people, but I believe his language would have had something of an elevated, eloquent tone to it. So I tried to capture, to steer a middle way between a vernacular, a colloquial English, but one with a somewhat elevated tone and which did try to remain faithful to the more technical terminology that was used, rather than to put it in a very flat English, uh, English terminology that would mm -hmm. be more easily digested, but maybe loses the technical uh, tone of those terms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the middle way is yeah. always the best. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How do we know that all the Pali texts that we have today are actually the authentic words of the Buddha? Do we know this? Can we say this with certainty? I don't think we have any way to confirm that with absolute certainty. So what I try to do in my thinking, and a lot of this has been supported by, you know, what's been, been done by sort of the next generation of scholars or monastic scholars, particularly maybe you know of the a German monk who's now living in the U.S., Venerable Analeo, yeah, Biku Analeo, who started out as a pupil of mine, by the way, yeah. <laughs> but his abilities with language far surpassed mine, his ability to handle multiple language mm -hmm. and to do very detailed uh, scho uh, scholarly studies. So anyway, he's done like schol comparative scholarly studies of Pali versions of suttas with their counterparts in the Chinese canon, in preserved in Tibetan and other ancient languages. 
And so from this, we could construct, we don't have any absolute certainty, but we can develop what I maybe call a probability scale. So mm -hmm. in regard to those texts in which there is a great deal of correspondence, very close correspondence between the different versions of a sutta, then we can have a fairly high degree of confidence that these suttas come. We can't say what comes directly from the Buddha himself, but we could say that we could have a fairly high degree of confidence that these suttas come from a very early period in the compilation of the Buddha's texts. And where there's disparities, differences between roughly parallel versions, then we could say that the schools, the different schools have developed a core sutta in somewhat different ways. And then sometimes we have to judge, make judgments about which one is more likely to be more archaic than the other. Mm -hmm. But basically, th though there might be differences in language, in the formulation of a sutta, in the structure of a sutta, but when we compare these different versions, we see that despite these little differences, there's pretty much substantial agreement on the central teachings and practices of early Buddhism. And so I think we could have a fairly high degree of confidence that these doctrines, like the five aggregates, four noble truths, dependent origination, the three marks of existence, and the practices like the four foundations of mindfulness and so on, come from the Buddha himself. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So most of Pariyati's listeners are Vipassana meditators who have varying levels of experience. Yeah. How important is it for them to study the words of the Buddha? I think it's quite, especially for the development of insight and called panya or wisdom, is important to get what I call an, a basic acquaintance with the canonical texts. It's certainly not necessary to become a scholar or to have a scholarly knowledge of the texts, but I say that there's certainly a core group of texts that a practitioner should become familiar with. And if you want specific recommendations, I sure. would say perhaps the first from the standpoint of developing panya and also the meditation practices aimed at developing and purification of the mind, I say maybe the first 30 suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya are very important. And then certain core chapters in the Sangyutta Nikaya, particularly those chapter 12 on dependent origination, chapter 22 on the five aggregates, chapter 35 on the 12 or six sense bases, six or 12 sense bases. And then the, the, in the Goenka tradition, which emphasizes contemplation of feeling, Vedana Anupasana, then chapter 36 brings together, I think about 30 or 40 suttas on contemplation of feelings, and then core chapters in the fifth book on the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, the four foundations of mindfulness, the seven factors of enlightenment. Yeah, those, I would say, are quite important to get, or very useful to get familiar with them. Great. I'll make that part of the curriculum of study. Okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. But, you know, it differs from person to person. Mm -hmm. Like there are some people who could make do and have quite excellent results in their meditation without becoming familiar with canonical texts at all. Okay. Um, yeah, but for others, it can be helpful to become acquainted with the text. Okay. And reading the suttas is not as easy a task as, mm -hmm. let's say, reading the Harry Potter series. The text I, often... I, the text I've, I've never read a Harry, Harry oh. Potter book. <laughs> Well, the texts often seem dense, complicated, and even repetitive. Like, why, why is this so? Why is it like that? Certainly, what were the three words you used? Dense? Complicated, complicated and, and repetitive. And repetitive. Certainly, they're repetitive. And this has to do somewhat with the uh, 
the way the texts were transmitted, because the texts were not written down during the first, what, 400 years of the Buddhist literary history, but they were transmitted orally. And I think it's a feature of oral literature that they involve, that it involves a lot of repetition. Um, dense is probably because the Dhamma itself is, the Buddha says, it's deep, difficult to see, difficult to understand. So in that way, it's maybe dense and complicated. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't seem to me so complicated, but um, to help resolve the problem of density or difficulty, what I think one sees in the text, and this is, it raises some questions in my mind that, okay, you have one sutta might mention a particular topic very concisely and then pass on to something else, almost assuming that the reader or listener is familiar with that topic. And so when you come across that a passage like that in the text, maybe you don't know what the Buddha is speaking about, but the texts have a rather elaborate system of what I call cross-references. So a theme that is just mentioned briefly in one sutta will be elaborated in another sutta. So it's in that other sutta that you get the full explanation, or at least the fuller explanation. For example, let's take, okay, a sutta in which the Buddha is elaborating the factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. Okay, so he says, what is the um, Noble Eightfold Path? Right view, then he'll explain understanding dukkha, its origin, cessation, and the path. Okay, then we come, jump over some other factors. What is right mindfulness? Here among dwells ardent, clearly comprehending and mindful, contemplating the body, in the body, feelings and feelings and so on. That is right mindfulness. So you get this brief explanation, Four Noble Truths. Uh, right view is the Four Noble Truths. Right mindfulness as a formula for the Four Foundations of Mindfulness. Okay, but then to get a fuller explanation, you have to go to another collection. In this case, it would be the for the right view, you would go to the Sangyutta Nikaya chapter on the Four Noble Truths, chapter 56, which will then give more detailed explanation of the truths. And then for the explanation of right mindfulness, one will go to maybe the Satipatthana Sutta, the Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 10, then you get a full explanation of right, right mindfulness. So, uh, so these are ways in which we can, meditators who want to study can yeah. help keep the suttas engaging and, and interesting and relevant is by doing these cross-references. Yeah, and, and maybe I could tell you how I like, came to learn the text fairly well <laughs> sure. yeah. when I was a little uh, a junior monk. Okay, the first time I read through the four Nikayas and then I would make, particularly for the Diga, and Majjhima Nikaya, I would make like short summaries of each suttas, of each sutta. But then I read through the text the second time. This time I was reading, the second time I was reading them in Pali. And what I did was to make up a list of the important topics that I came across. And I would have sheets of notebook paper. And then whenever I came across a sutta which had some important explanation of any of those topics, then I would just put down a short summary of the point the sutta is making and give a reference to the sutta itself. So I would have like sheets on the Four Noble Truths, then sheets on the five aggregates, then sheet on any one of those aggregates that's treated in some detail, then a sheet on impermanence, a sheet on dukkha, a sheet on maybe several sheets on um, anatta, non-self, then a section on dependent origination, sections on the Noble Eightfold Path, and the other group of uh, Bodhi Pakya Dharmas, the groups of enlightenment factors, sheet on samadhi, on panya, and so on. 
And then I was able to sort of see the cross references within the canonical text. And I guess this might have helped you write your anthologies, because I noticed some of your work, uh, you have the suttas in categories or in, in themes. So th I guess this approach helped with those. Yeah, I think it's particularly the one called in the Buddha's words. Yeah, it's almost um, it's largely based on, <laughs> on those raw handwritten notes that I compiled back in, was it 1973, 1974? Wow, great. So um, many meditators in the West, as well as in Asia, hold scientific and secular worldviews. Yeah. And many are even allergic to religion altogether. Yeah. How important is it for these meditators to accept traditional Buddhist metaphysical concepts like karma and rebirth, yeah. notions that are difficult, if not impossible, yeah. to verify for oneself? How do yeah. you make sense of these concepts? Okay, first, I'm not, you know, dog, I don't tend to be dogmatic about these particular teachings and say, mm -hmm. if you want to be a good practitioner, you have to accept karma, you have to accept rebirth. Yeah. But what the, the way I s s present this is that you start off, you know, practicing those aspects of the Dharma that you can see for yourself, that you could verify for yourself and see whether they're beneficial, whether they really induce beneficial changes in your life. Okay, if you can confirm through your direct experience that these particular practice, that these teachings are meaningful to the extent that one could see them for oneself, and these practices are beneficial to the extent that they can make positive transformations in your life, that should serve as a strong inducement for placing trust and confidence in those aspects of the teaching that lie beyond one's present capacity for direct confirmation. Okay. So what I would say is, you know, don't write these teachings off. If you, if you can't see them, confirm them for yourself, and you don't want to believe them, you just want to stick with what you can see and confirm for yourself, you know, as long as you engage in the wholesome, that's good enough. But if you really want to practice the Dharma to the full extent, then I would say that these teachings provide the illuminating background, framing and context for the doctrine and the practice. And I have some sort of arguments that I use, or let's say illustrations that I use to show, let's see, the tenability of some of these teachings like karma and rebirth. Should I give you the example? Yes, please do, please do. Okay. This was something that occurred to me when I was living back in Sri Lanka. I was living in a forest hermitage in Kandy, and we didn't have main stream electricity there, main current electricity. So I would get my information about what's going on in the world from, we had a portable radio with shortwave, shortwave channels. And I would listen every day to the BBC World Service, which came in, I think, on shortwave band one. Okay, one day I turned on the radio and I went to the place in the band where I get the BBC World Service, but it didn't come. And then I went back and forth along the band. What happened to the BBC World Service? Couldn't get it any place. And then I looked more closely at, at, the, at the radio, and I saw that through carelessness, I must have switched, hit the band dial, and it went from shortwave one to FM. And on FM, or AM maybe, on AM, couldn't get... BBC World Service. And then the analogy occurred to me. <laughs> Somebody might be on AM, the AM band, looking for BBC World Service, can't get it. And then he comes to the conclusion, BBC World Service is a myth, a fiction, maybe a construct of <laughs> British metaphysics. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> propagated out of maybe the halls of philosophy department of Oxford University. <laughs> but I can't confirm it for myself. So BBC World Service doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> By the same token, we could say, okay, the Buddhist texts speak about deva realms, celestial realms, ghostly realms, hell realms. I can't see them with my present uh, mental capacity. So I say, ah, they don't exist. <laughs> but if I'm able to switch the bandwidth of my mind through powerful samadhi to different levels, then I can tune into those other realms of existence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if, if for, for many of us who maybe have trouble tuning into those realms, yeah. um, to those bandwidths, do you think we need to buy into the concepts to truly uproot all the mental def defilements and achieve liberation? Or, or even just proper ethical reasoning from a Dhamma perspective? Are these dependent on these concepts? You know, this is something about which I can't make apodictic comments or can't make you know, an absolutely authoritative proclamation. Yeah. But it, it seems to me just intuitively that in order to have the motivation to uproot the mental defilements and to gain liberation, because liberation means being liberated from puna bhava, from repeated existence, the cycle of repeated existence. And the mental defilements are what sustain the round of repeated existence. So it seems that without having a conviction about the truth of the reality of karma, of rebirth, that one would not have a view that is in harmony with the right view of the Dharma. And so it seems that the inability to place complete trust and confidence in those teachings would be an obstacle to reaching that final goal. That's just my sort of conjecture. Okay. Okay. So Thank the you. things are possible that I maybe that go against what I assume to be the case. Okay, great. So speaking about right view and anatta, uh, so the three existential characteristics are anicca, dukkha, and anatta. Yeah. Anatta, often translated as non-self, is more obscure than impermanence and suffering or, or yeah. dissatisfaction. Can you, for the benef benefit of our listeners, can you please explain the concept of anatta and discuss why it's important for those on the path of liberation to really understand what it means? Okay, anatta is what we translate as non-self, and it's a negation of the idea that we have at the core of our being an atta, or the Sanskrit word is atman, a kind of substantial, persistent self. Um, the idea of or the concept of anatta is not a negation of our empirical personality. It doesn't mean that we don't exist as persons, as individuals. But it, what it means is that sort of at the core of our being, we don't have that there's no substantial persisting agent behind our actions and this persisting persistent subject of experience, a truly existing I or ego entity that remains the same throughout the changing flux of experience. So anatta means that our experience is a constant flux, a flux of bodily and mental phenomena that are constantly arising and passing away. But because they arise and pass away so rapidly, they create the kind of illusion of a persisting entity, a self. And according to the Buddha's teaching, that grasping upon the idea of 
of the self, of the ego entity, of the truly existing I, is sort of at the root or the basis of first experience suffering of all of our pain, misery, grief, worry, stress, anxiety, and so on, and also at the root or basis of our migration through the cycle of repeated birth and death. And so therefore, to gain liberation, one has to see into the reality of anatta, non-self, which again is not the negation of ourselves as persons, but seeing into what we refer to or identify with as myself, what I am, is this constellation of, to use the Buddhist technical term, of the five aggregates, the five collections of bodily and mental phenomena. That is bodily form or material form, feeling, perception, then the volitional formations, all the mental activities involved in volitional action, and then consciousness. And so those five groups of factors are functioning together through conditions, creating this illusion or appearance of an I or self, which is the fundamental delusion. And through the practice of insight meditation, one sees through that delusion and dispels the illusion of the I, and then that paves the way to liberation. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that distinction between negating the everyday empirical understanding uh, or empirical experience of a person versus sort of this ex the, the experience itself of anatta. Um, so how, how does our understanding of anatta impact our relationships with other people and with the environment? And how might it form our assumptions about the world? Yeah, this I think is where if somebody sort of wrongly grasps the teaching of anatta, it maybe can lead in an unwholesome direction or an undesirable mm -hmm. direction. So if somebody like wrongly grasps Anatta and thinks that there's no self anywhere, nobody has any self, and so they think that their task is just to sort of cut off all human relationships and to stand back without any concern for the natural environment. So here I think the teaching, the wisdom teaching of Anatta has to be complemented with first at the philosophical level the recognition of the reality of empirical persons as being human beings or subjects of experience in their own right, not permanent substantial subjects, but as being conscious subjects of experience. And, that, and then that will be complemented by developing the positive virtues of, sometimes we call them the four Brahma Viharas or divine qualities of loving kindness, compassion, al altruistic or em empathic joy, and impartiality. Yeah, so we need those four virtues, four qualities as the basis for our human relationship. And then now particularly, maybe this is a problem that was not faced so critically in the Buddha's time, but now is becoming like the overwhelming, all-embracing problem that we face as a human community, and that is the ecological devastation, particularly manifest in what they call it climate change, but I think that word is a bit misleading. I would call it cli climate destabilization or climate devastation. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to you know, balance our drive towards liberation through insight into anatta with an overwhelming concern to preserve a livable environment, a flourishing environment as a basis for human beings to flourish and also as a basis for us to maintain our practice. So in connection to, to that concern and that um, des desire for, for harmony, um, global harmony, climate harmony, 
might there be a connection between anatta and the concept of interdependence that we see both in later Buddhist traditions as well as in indigenous ways of knowing and relating to the world? Yeah, I would say actually that that comes, that, that recognition of interdependence, interconnectedness can be developed out of the, not so much the teaching of anatta directly, but more from the teaching of Paticca Samuppada, dependent origination, dependent arising, the teaching that everything, that all phenomena, all conditioned phenomena arise through conditions. And in, in the early Buddhist texts, the teaching of dependent arising is connected particularly with the chain of conditions that is responsible for our bondage and samsara. But it can be given like broader applications, including the application to the interdependence, interrelationship between human beings and the natural environment, and even to an insight into the cohesion, coherence, and integral interdependence about everything between everything in our world, all natural phenomena. Mm. The way even like when not aware of it, but human beings, we depend so critically upon the insect population and upon uh, the bacteria. You know, our bodies themselves are composed of billions of bacteria, which perform so many essential functions for us. For us. Mm -hmm. And so if those insect population is decimated through environmental devastation, if the bacteria popula populations are devastated, then the human life that depends upon them will also collapse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and following that, I find that the interweaving of so many domains makes it increasingly difficult to apply or support the principle and practice of non-harm. For instance, most of our clothing is made by people in the developing world who receive very low wages. They work yeah. under very dangerous conditions. They don't yeah. have access to proper health care, education, yeah. housing, et cetera. Even the food we eat is often yeah. riddled with labor rights issues and, as you said, environmental yeah. degradation, and not even to mention the mass murder of farm animals. So for someone wishing to follow the Dhamma principles of non-harm, how do we go about facing such situ situations, even like more ambiguous ones than that, when it's nearly impossible to actually know the consequences of our actions, because there's all this interweaving happening? Yeah, that, that's it's it's a very difficult question and a very difficult dilemma to wiggle one's way out of. What I would say is that one should make an effort to know where the objects that one is using, the commodities that one is purchasing, the food one is eating, and so on, make some effort to know where it's coming from and to, you know, to reduce the harmful impact that one is making through one's lifestyle, through one's purchases. Ideally, one should try to live as simply as possible, though here in the United States, in the West, you know, it's, it's very difficult to do that. For example, if you're living in a small town where there's not mass transportation to get to one's job, one has to use a car. To use the car, one has to use gasoline, and the gasoline will be contributing to, you know, to global warming. Um, the food that we eat, as you've mentioned, a lot of it has been prepared by farmers who are underpaid, who are exploited. Uh, the clothing that we wear is maybe a lot of it is produced in countries like Bangladesh, maybe Sri Lanka, mainland China, where people are working for you know, extremely low wages, almost bare subsistent wages. Yeah, so it's just so difficult to avoid. We just have to do our best to avoid harmful actions. And as far as diet goes, I certainly encourage people, you know, the Buddhist, early Buddhism, it doesn't make vegetarianism compulsory. 
but I would encourage people who are really sincere practitioners to adopt as much as possible a vegetarian or even a vegan diet. So mm -hmm. I, I have to say that when I was a monk in Sri Lanka, I was not com complete vegetarian. I tried to be, but it was difficult because people would regularly serve the main source of protein was fish and sometimes chicken. But after I came back to the United States, now I've become complete vegetarian, almost vegan, not completely. Mm -hmm. So we're currently living in a very politically corrosive time that has serious consequences on human society. And I find there's often um, a debate amongst meditators. On the one hand, there's some meditators who think well, as part of our spiritual practice, we should be engaged politically or environmentally. And on the other hand, there's a camp that believes that, well, the, the meditator, the serious meditator should live a very quiet, private, um, non-engaged meditative life. Mm. So I'm wondering is what, what you think about that. And is there a connection between the Buddha's transformative meditative practices with social engagement, advocacy work, philanthropy, and so forth. Okay, again, you know, I don't take any kind of like categorical dogmatic stand on this, saying that all meditators have to be socially engaged. If you're not socially engaged, you're not a true practitioner. But maybe I could speak a bit from my own, you know, personal experience. Sure, okay, do. before I encountered that Buddhist monk in Vietnam, that Buddhist monk from Vietnam when I was in graduate school, I was somewhat politically engaged, particularly that was the time of, of the Vietnam War. And so I was a staunch opponent of the Vietnam War and also concerned about civil rights. There was a time when the civil rights movement was underway. Um, but then when I first encountered Buddhism through my connection with that Buddhist monk, then I thought my task now is to look after my own inward cultivation. And that's how I could be of the greatest long-term benefit to others. So I pretty much, and then during that period and my early years in Sri Lanka, I pretty much just lost interest in world events and just focused on my Dharma studies and my meditation. But then in the 1980s, then I, be, I was appointed the, as the editor for the Buddhist Publication Society. And we were publishing a newsletter in which I would be writing cover essays. And I thought I have to now sort of investigate and come to understand the relevance of the Buddha Dharma to the situation of the world, to events that are going on in the world. And so as I looked into what you would call mundane events, worldly events, I came to see like critical interconnections, like what kind of the important ways in which the Buddhist values could contribute to social upliftment and social transformation to create a more just, more peaceful, more compassionate world. And then after I came back to the United States in 2002, then I first had access to the internet, and then I could get much more information about what is taking place in the world. And just sort of spontaneously, my own attitude went, underwent maybe dramatic changes. And so I became very much concerned about developments taking place in this country and their impact on the wider world. At that time, we became engaged first in the war in Afghanistan, which I never agreed with as a way of correcting the attack on the World Trade Center in 9, on September 11th. And then I knew, I, I mean, it was so obvious that the George W. Bush administration was concocting false pretexts for engaging in the war in, on Iraq and then expanding that war throughout the Middle East and even into, North, into countries in Africa. And so it seemed to me almost to be at a critical part of my own engage, my own commitment as a conscientious Buddhist to become aware of these events and to take stand upon them and to try to uh, 
contribute in whatever way I can through signing petitions and so forth and connecting with organizations that are working to promote greater social economic justice, greater political, uh, to preserve our democracy in the face of threats to the democracy. And then I wound up in the year 2008, th after some discussions with some of my students and friends, we wound up forming an organization dedicated to the purpose of combating the problem of chronic hunger and malnutrition around the world. The organization is called Buddhist Global Relief. Mm -hmm. And I'm not you know, completely involved with the organization on a day-to-day -day basis, but I'm the chairman of the organization. But we have a regular staff of lay people who do the day-to-day -day work. But of course, I, as the chairperson, I oversee the organization and participate in the, you know, the discussions and the you know the decisions that are made mm -hmm. in running the organization can you tell us a little bit about what the buddhist global relief does like some of the details yeah when we started the oh, buddhist okay. global relief in 2008 we thought that we should have an organization that would be dedicated to addressing all the problems of social oppression, injustice, poverty that afflict people around the world. But in a short time, we realized that that was just too broad a mission. And so we decided to narrow down the mission to focus on the problem of chronic hunger and malnutrition that afflicts close to a billion, about 800 million people around the world. And so that became the specific focal mission of Buddhist Global Relief. But then as we looked into the methods of tackling hunger and malnutrition, it started to widen the scope since we saw that to address hunger and malnutrition, it's not enough just to support projects that provide direct food aid, but we also have to address some of the underlying roots of hunger. And so one of the very major underlying roots we found was the subordinate status of girls and women in many traditional cultures. And so the way to over, for these cultures, for the people in these cultures to overcome poverty and thereby to overcome hunger is to promote the education of girls. And so a lot of our projects do promote the education of girls, giving girls the opportunity to continue in school until they complete high school, and in many cases, then go on to university studies. Mm -hmm. And then sort of, in a way parallel to that, is to supporting women in their families, enabling them to start right livelihood projects in order to earn more to support their families. And so we have in this way, our the range of our projects broaden so that we have projects that provide direct food aid to those in critical need in overcoming hunger. And then to broaden the range, we have projects that support the education of girls, projects that support right livelihood opportunities for women. And then also as a way of dealing with climate change, projects that support ecologically sustainable models of agriculture. If people want to learn more, they can go to search on Google for Buddhist global relief. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe if we can, we can uh, post in the show notes, post that link for people who are interested to learn more or help out in whatever way they can. Okay, uh, I'll just, uh, before we wrap up, because I know your, your time is limited, so maybe I could just ask you one more question around um, right speech. Because right speech, um, I find, is, is one of the most challenging aspects um, on, on the path. So I'm just wondering if you can perhaps discuss some of the various components of right speech, and do you have any suggestions for practicing it effectively? Okay. Okay. So according to the canonical text, there are four aspects of right speech. 
And these are formulated both negatively with positive counterparts. Okay, so on the negative side, first we have abstaining from false speech. And then on the positive, the positive counterpart to that is to speak the truth, which doesn't mean that one speaks the truth uh, the way I understand it, invariably on every occasion, since sometimes out of you know respect for others to be discreet, one has to keep silent if one speaks the truth too openly it can create conflict and enmity so one has to be skillful in one's uh, the way one formulates a truthful speech okay the second component of right speech is to on the negative side one avoids what is called malicious speech or divisive speech that means speaking badly about others with the intention of creating divisions, conflicts, disharmony amongst group between group, people who have been united, people who are on friendly terms with each other. So sometimes you see people are friendly and you want to win a particular person to yourself. And so you will speak denigrating words about the other person that you want to create disharmony between the two instead of the positive side what is encouraged is what is enjoined is speak that speech that will promote harmony that will promote unity that will bring people separated from each other that will bring them together in friendly relations Okay, the third factor of right speech is to avoid harsh and angry speech, speech which is said cuts into the inner inside of others and creates hurt and pain. And instead, one should speak gently, politely, in cordial ways, ways that win the affection of others. And then the fourth, is to avoid sometimes the way I translate it is idle chatter. Um, it could also maybe be understood as gossip. So this is just engaging in a lot of useless, frivolous talk. And instead, the way it's formulated in the text, it almost has a monastic person in mind that one should speak what is meaningful, what is connected with the Dharma. Um, yeah, so, and so one should make the efforts to avoid frivolous or useless speech. When I mean, in people in their day-to-day -day relationships, they're not always going to be speaking about <laughs> the Dharma or otherwise keeping silent. But one should maybe keep some watch over one's mind to ensure that one is not just, you know, veering off into a lot of just idle chatter, chatting about this, chatting about that but try to keep one's communications meaningful and pithy. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes I find ordinary day-to-day -day speech, whether maybe it's about the weather or the election results or the performance of the local sports team, these are often considered to be frivolous or, or speech or idle speech. But sometimes I find at the same time, such ordinary speech has a bonding effect among people. And so sometimes I notice um, if I'm talking to my neighbor um, and, you know, he complains about the weather and, and, and I agree with him and I complain a little bit about the weather, it actually in some way seems like it's uniting us. But would that still be considered wrong speech? No, I don't, I don't think that's wrong speech at all. I think there are many kinds of just speech about ordinary topics that one has to engage in in everyday life in order to create you know bonds of friendship and unity and good feeling between people yeah so maybe a good way to understand that fourth factor is to avoid like gossip just chatting about others in ways that are if it if it's chatting about others in ways that are intended to create conflict and disharmony then it comes into the second factor but chatting about others in ways that are just maybe not intended to create disharmony, but just harping on the faults of others, complaining about others, 
and so on. Maybe that will come under idle chatter. I see. But um, what about sharp, unpleasant criticism of political oppression or social injustice? Yeah. Aren't yeah. there suttas where the Buddha did encourage uh, sharp criticism under certain circumstances? Yeah, this is interesting because I find that the Buddhist example maybe doesn't completely fit into the model of the four types of right speech that he that he lays down in the text. And in fact, the Buddha does give, there's a sutta which highlights that, that he says that what he speaks, it's invariably true. Let's see, it's invariably meaningful or beneficial, but sometimes it's agreeable and sometimes agreeable to others. And sometimes it's disagreeable to others. And in that case, the Buddha says, the Tathagata, that's the Buddha, knows the right time to utter that speech. And so I think for us in our day-to-day -day life, it is under certain conditions, it's essential to speak up in ways that are strong, even critical of others. And I have to say really candidly, when we look at what's going on in the political process in this country, it's really necessary to speak up strongly, sharply, and critically, not angrily. We have to try to control the mind, not let the mind be overwhelmed by anger and lose control. But we have to see where there's right, where there's wrong, and we have to speak up if we have the knowledge and the ability to speak up strongly on behalf of right and against what is wrong. Speak up in defense of truth and against falsehood and lies that are creating a lot of conflict, divisions, and maybe, maybe even dangerous trends within this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, so I said that would be my last question. So maybe I don't want to go into wrong speech and ask you more questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, sometimes uh, I have to say that sometimes I speak up very candidly and very sharply on some of these issues. And I do get criticized from some other Buddhists who say a monk should not speaking about should not be speaking about these issues. But I find it to be a sort of important call of my own sense of conscience to be to come forth and speak from a standpoint of the Dharma critically about issues where I see the drift of society going in ways that are contrary to the spirit of the Dharma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And does the Buddhist global relief, do they, is it just about education and nutrition or is there a political angle as well? No, we try to avoid Buddhist global relief taking a political angle. Great. Because it's basically, it's a 501c3 charity. So we, we shouldn't take political stands. I see. So we would advocate, say, policies on policies that promote greater, say, food aid to poor countries or to poor people within the United States. We don't sort of advocate for political, for particular political figures against, for certain figures against other figures. I see, good. And so is, the, is there any, anything you would like to share about more about these things we've been talking about, ethics or right view or study? Um, any, any last words that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, well, I would just say, sort of speaking in general, I would say that it's very important for practitioners of the Dharma, this is from my own point of view, to be willing to come forth and to stand up for, sort of to express, to manifest loving kindness and compassion, not only in their individual personal relationships with others, but also in the stands that they take, the way they relate to the greater society in which we're living in order to maybe to establish a more articulate Buddhist voices in defense of, let's say, a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-generational democracy against the tendencies for, I would say, a, a theocratic, autocratic forms of government governance that are tending to emerge within this country. I hope that's not too political. 
<laughs> we won't hold that against you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So that's been a real pleasure, a real honor to, to, to have your perspective with us today. Thank you. So for those of you who have sent in questions, uh, we'll now start reading the questions aloud. So th this first question actually comes from Sayada Ujagara, who I believe you know. He was a, he's a Burmese Buddhist monk from, from Montreal, Quebec. Oh, I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, so, yeah. So, so he asks, you've been living and associating with both Theravada and Mahayana monks throughout your life. What could Theravada practitioners learn from Mahayana practice and philosophy? And on the other hand, what in the Theravada tradition could benefit Mahayana practitioners? Okay, maybe I'll start with the second point. Sure. Uh, yeah, well, what I've discovered is that now among certain segments of educated Mahayana Buddhists, both monks and lay people, there's a very, very keen interest in going back you know, past the arising of the Mahayana Buddhism in India and coming back to the early Buddhist texts. Because even though in the Chinese, say in the Chinese Tripitaka, there is a section which preserves the Agamas. The Agamas are the collections of the early Buddhist discourses that come from other Buddhist schools that were parallel to the Theravada school, but they have counterparts to the Diga Nikaya, Majjhima Nikaya, Sangyutta Nikaya, Anguttara Nikaya. And so amongst Chinese Mahayana Buddhists, well, actually, well, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Mahayana Buddhists, there's, and Vietnamese, there's a lot of interest in going back both to the Chinese Agamas and also learning Pali and reading the Pali Nikayas. Yeah, in fact, several nuns from Taiwan had come to study Pali with me back starting in 2005. And then from there, they went on to University of Hong Kong to work on PhDs, and they wrote their, their dissertations on based on the Pali Canon. Yeah, so I think what's a particularly, you know, what's been lacking in East Asian Mahayana is an understanding of the fundamental Buddhist teachings that come from the layer of the, from the early Buddhist schools, including the Theravada, Savastivada, and so on. Mm -hmm. And on the other part of the question, you know, somewhat surprise. What might be somewhat surprising is that the Theravada, onward Theravada tradition, in its development in India, actually picked up already quite a bit from Indian Mahayana Buddhism. Like years ago, this would be 1976, 77. I was doing the translation of the Brahmajala Sutta, that's the first discourse in the Digha Nikaya, together with this commentary and parts of the sub-commentary. And in the sub-commentary, there's a kind of a digression on the paramis or the paramitas. And that section was laying down these statements about the paramitas that sounded very authoritative but I couldn't find what is the source that the commentator is, is drawing upon for this material. <clears throat> and sometime later, I came across a work from the Yogacara school, it's called the Bodhisattva Bhumi. And I found exactly those passages in the Bodhisattva Bhumi. So it was apparent that Dharmapala, who was the author of the sub commentaries, was already familiar with the Yoga Chara Bhumi and perhaps some other works of Indian Mahayana Buddhism and drew upon those texts to develop the treatise on the Paramis. And so a nun from Taiwan <laughs> told me that they used to invite Burmese monk to come to Taiwan to, <laughs> to conduct retreats, meditation retreats. And at the end of the retreat, he would be teaching them like his discourse towards the end of the retreat would be on the paramitas and he would be teaching them based on that treatise by Dhammapala, the sub-commentator. <laughs> 
And so she said, here we, we invite a, a, a Burmese monk, a monk from the Theravada tradition to come to Taiwan to conduct a retreat. And he's teaching us my, Mahayana <laughs> Buddhism. <laughs> Uh, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. So I would say that um, well, that the Theravada has already absorbed quite a bit from the Mahayana in its later development. Okay. And maybe there's a certain flexibility that I found in the Mahayana that resonates more with me, where sometimes I find, this is particularly in monastic life, that Ther Theravadans can be sometimes a little bit too sort of strict and narrow-minded. Whereas okay. I find with the Mahayana, there's sometimes a greater flexibility, sometimes maybe too much flexibility. Okay. So an another question comes in about uh, your own decision to become a monk. So the questioner asks, have you ever doubted your decision to become a monk or even consider giving up the monastic life and return to society to lead a lay life if so, what kept you from disrobing and gave you the confidence and strength mm. to carry on? Yeah. Actually, this gets to be a rather personal matter. But you see, when I became a monk in Sri Lanka, um, so I went to Sri Lanka in 1972 to become a monk. And I was there for five years. And my parents had been very upset that I became a monk. You know, because monastic, uh, permission from the parents is necessary to receive monastic ordination. Mm -hmm. So when I asked my parents for permission, they said, well, you're an adult, you can make your own decision. And so this is really up to you. But we really wish that you wouldn't go to Sri Lanka to become a monk. And then after I went, I would get bombarded by letters from my father telling me how much how miserable my mother was feeling. My mother would send me letters telling me how upset my father was. And so after five years, I decided that I have to go back to the U.S. And to go back, there's at that time almost no monasteries, Theravada monasteries in the U.S. And so I'd have to go back, and so I would have to disrobe. And so I made up the mind that well, I didn't want to give up the monastic life, but I thought that I had to settle this problem with my parents. And so I decided that I would disrobe and return to the U.S., and I actually had fixed the date for my disrobing. This would have been in August 1972, uh, 77. Mm -hmm. But as that date was approaching, more and more the thought came to me that really I felt like the purpose of my life was to be a monk and that I didn't want to disrobe. And so then I went and I spoke to my teacher, who was the German monk, Venerable Jana Ponika Mahatera. And he said, in that case, don't disrobe, just go back as a monk. And I did. Mm. Well, since, I, that, yeah, since I, that time, I never had any thought of disrobing. Well, I can say, well, myself and I'm sure thousands upon thousands of meditators are, are very grateful that you didn't disrobe. <laughs> <laughs> Your work has been a real great guide for us. And, and this is a, another question that's maybe a little bit connected, um, just about Judaism. And why do you think so many Jewish people are attracted to Dhamma mm. and Buddhism, and why have there been so many Buddhist teachers and scholars who were also Jewish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm Jewish myself, yeah, by I, background. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I didn't have a particularly religious background. In fact, my parents were religiously, I would say that they were agnostic, but they would observe, we would go to the synagogue for the Jewish high holidays, and we would observe, observe some of the Jewish ceremonies, but just to preserve the cultural tradition rather mm -hmm. than out of religious faith. Yeah, what seems to be, to be the case, and maybe that my family is typical in that respect, is that in for many Jewish people, there's not that strong, for contemporary Jewish people, there's not that strong religious belief or belief in the religious tenets of Judaism, but a very highly developed ethical consciousness and maybe because the Jews through the centuries have lacked a fixed homeland that they could call their own. So wandering through Europe, they developed um, a capacity for independent thought, 
and investigation and explorations. And I think that would dispose, say, Americans from my generation of Jewish background to an interest in Buddhism and a willingness to explore other domains and territories of thought quite different from that of Judaism. Okay, great. So the next question comes from uh, a teacher in the, Vipass in the SN Goenka tradition from Klaus Notnagel, who's also a, a Pali teacher. He teaches Pali to yeah. a lot of Vipassana students. And um, so he writes, in the Digha Nikaya, it yeah. includes the following suttas that are more devotional and don't mm -hmm. really have much to do with the Buddhist teachings. Yeah. The Atanatya Sutta, the Mahasamaya yeah. Sutta, the Mahasudas, Mahasudasana Sutta. What yeah. do you think was the intention behind including these suttas? Yeah. And then the second part is connected. Can you surmise as to when were these texts added as they seem to have a Mahayana flavor yeah. and don't fit with the meter and content of most other suttas? Yeah, I think as a way of approaching that question, one has to look at the different Nikayas and ask whether there is any sort of overriding purpose behind these different collections. And any answer is partly tentative because we don't have a definite, you know, historical evidence to draw upon, but just we could draw some conclusions based on the contents of the different Nikayas. And I'm not original in this. There are some other scholars who have done investigations along this line. Particularly, I was, my thinking had been influenced by a, some, several papers. Joy Manet was her name. She published these papers, I think it was in the Buddhist Studies Review back in the 1980s or, or 1990s. And she was comparing that seemed to be the intention of the Diga Nikaya and the Majjhima Nikaya. And the conclusion that she came to is that the suttas of the Majjhima Nikaya, by and large, not invariably, but by and large, seem to be directed inward towards the Buddhist community and serve the purpose of sort of drawing newly people who have newly embraced Buddhism, particularly those who have entered the monastic order, sort of inculcating in them a knowledge and understanding of the basic tenets of the Buddha's teaching, the basic practices. And we can see this fairly clearly in the first 50 suttas of the Majjhima Nikaya, and maybe some of the suttas in the last 50, particularly in the 140s group of suttas. In contrast, she found that many of the suttas in the Dika Nikaya seem to be directed outwards towards the broader Indian society or culture of that period. And so we have suttas in which the Buddha is debating against the Brahmins about their claims for caste superiority in order to show that, you know, that their claims of purity of caste are groundless. Um, the Buddha is engages in discussions with some of the ascetics who indulge in these practices of strict asceticism in order to show that those practices don't lead to ultimate liberation. And instead, the Buddha proclaims the gradual training through sila, samadhi, and panya. And then we have other suttas that are intended to instill a, a kind of flavor of devotion in maybe those who have newly come to Buddhism or those in the broader Indian society. Like for example, in the middle book of the Diga Nikaya, the Mahabhadana Sutta, giving the so-called biographical sketches of the previous Buddhas from the Pasi, Siki, Vesabhu, and so forth. And then we have the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the account of the last journey of the Buddha up to his parini up to his parinibbana and his passing away and so it seems to me that the early buddhists recognized that the buddhists also had to uh, were to some extent in competition 
with the Brahmins, with Brahmanism. And so they had to come up with some authoritative text that could serve the function for the greater society that the Brahmins, with their, with their access to the Vedas, were performing. And so people, like ordinary people living their day-to-day -day life, would not be concerned with the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination, the three marks of existence, vipassana meditation. But what they want and need is protection, some sense of formulas that will give some sense of security. And so I would say that these suttas were composed, constructed for the purpose of serving those needs, fulfilling those needs. Uh, for offering texts that the Buddhist monks could recite for the lay community and for general people in the general population to confer blessing powers and security and protection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really fascinating to know how much a role context has yeah. lay yeah. When, when we read suttas and try to understand them. So um, another question is connected yeah, to- I didn't get to the second part. Oh, sorry. Sorry. The second okay. part of the question was when those texts were composed. So that I could answer very, very simply. Sure, because we only have about 12, yeah. 13 minutes. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's the kind of question maybe Venerable Analio would be better equipped to yeah. answer. <laughs> okay, do you, do you want to answer the second part briefly? That's, that's my, my brief answer is that I don't oh, know. Okay, okay. <laughs> Call it. Call up your uh, prize student. Yeah. Um, okay. So uh, this next question refers to, refers to the ten fetter bottle, and uh, it, it goes. Please explain the difference between the first fetter, which is self -ident identity view, sakaya ditti, yeah. and the seventh fetter, which is conceit or yeah. mano. So what's the difference between this first fetter, self identity, and the seventh fetter, which is conceit? Yeah, so that, that's a quite subtle point in dharma. Okay, so the first fetter is called Sakaya Ditti, which is a view regarding Sakaya, a term very, very difficult to translate, almost impossible. Um, so, so Sat is existing, Kaya is body, but it, what it refers to is the collection of the five aggregates. So this is a view of a self in relation to the five aggregates a view that might take one or another of the aggregates to be the self, but to hold that the self is outside the aggregates, but an entity that possesses them, or that the self is within the aggregates, or that the aggregates exist within the self. So this is a conceptually formulated view, and that fetter that all the varieties of the view of self are eliminated with the first breakthrough experience, the attainment of stream entry. Because with that breakthrough experience, one sees into the truth of, of the Dharma, which means seeing into the truth of non-self, in which case all conceptual or intellectualized philosophical views or religiously based views of a self, a soul, and so on are eliminated. But the seventh fetter, mana, which is translated as conceit, is a non-conceptual, um, a non-conceptual notion of an I, of a true, of, of an I, this kind of spontaneously arisen notion of an I, which is not accepted at face value and then interpreted as a self, but it's just a habitual tendency for that concept or notion of I to arise and for one to identify oneself in some way and then use that as a basis for comparisons, for thinking I'm better or I'm equal or I'm worse. And mm -hmm. so that is a more emotionally grounded notion, which therefore it's eliminated only at the fourth stage the stage of our hardship. Yeah. And the most useful text in the Sutta Pitaka for understanding that distinction is Sangyuta Nikaya, chapter 22, the chapter on the aggregates. I think it's Sutta number 89. It's called the Kemaka Sutta. I know the number because this question often comes up 
in my classes, and then I always refer to that sutta for clarification. Okay, so would you say that the first is could the, the first fetter is is more on a conscious level, and then the seventh fetter might be more on an unconscious level? Could could that be a, another way to understand it? Yeah, though I say the second, I, I still the 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 mana or the conceit, it's still it's a conscious experience. But let's say it's the first, the view is more conceptual, whereas the mana, the conceit, is non-conceptual. It's just sort of a spontaneously arisen notion. Yeah. Good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so another question here, so there's actually so many questions here. Some of them are quite complicated. So I'll go to a, um, a simpler one. Um, so the suttas show us that the Buddha not only taught monks, nuns, and lay people to meditate, but he also gave advice to kings, traders, priests, and so forth. Should Dhamma teachers be proactive by prescribing engaged actions, or should they remain politically neutral and let meditators figure that out on their own? I think I dealt with questions like that in the interview towards the, the, the last part of the interview sure you yeah, did so I, yeah I think so, maybe this is more about like teachers and, and monks but oh i be... see okay 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 then i think i see yeah my sort of uh policy when i'm teaching dhamma i try i certainly would not like advocate for a candidate or for a particular political party, um, though I think it would be important for a teacher, maybe not a, when giving med meditation instruction, but when teaching the Dhamma in a, in a different context, not a meditative context, to try to work out the ethical implications of, say, policy issues currently under discussion or being, you know, you know, being mooted in, in the country. So what would be the, the appropriate Buddhist approach in dealing with some of these social mm -hmm. and political problems, taking a moral point of view? Okay. Um, okay, we have five minutes. So th this question is more about your, um, your creative process. And the question is, what is your approach and process for writing? Do you have any, um, is there any insight on how you go about it from start to finish from completing a book or article? Yeah, I'm, I'm not a creative writer, like a, like a novelist or one who no, turns out. No, you're an essayist. You're, yeah. you're, an, you're an essayist. Too. Yeah, generally uh, when I write essays and I write about particular problems that what I want to address, then maybe what I would do would be to sketch out some ideas about the, yeah, in fact, that's a, an important lesson that I've had to learn. Don't just begin writing, starting off with the first paragraph, but first uh, jot down the ideas that one wants to develop, the point of view that, that one wants to develop. And then one could start building a structure in which to present that point of view. Okay. So you start off with a draft outline and then fill in. The yeah, idea. not even with an outline, not even at that point. In fact, I haven't used the outlines in a long time, but just jotting down some of the ideas that one wants to convey, the points that one wants to cover. Okay. Great. So for the last question, which introductory and which advanced or scholarly Dhamma book or books would you recommend that every meditator read? So which introductory and which scholarly books would you recommend for meditators to read? You're allowed to say your own. <laughs> well, it depends on whether you want an exposition of, on meditation or like canonical texts. So what I recommend for those who want to become familiar with the Pali canonical text but are not yet familiar, what I do recommend is, is actually the anthology that I compiled in the Buddha's words, mm -hmm. which, because the problem with the Nikayas, for those who have tried to read them, is that there's no discernible, meaningful structure to them. 
maybe partial exception to this of the Sangyutta Nikaya, but they're just arranged sometimes just around key words that might appear within the suttas. So what I did it with in the Buddha's words is to draw upon a scheme mentioned in the commentaries of the three types of benefit to which the Buddha's teaching leaves, the, leads the welfare and happiness in this present life, a fortunate rebirth in the next life, and then ultimate liberation. And then I took numbers of texts and used them to fill in those, those three categories. Yeah, so that's for getting acquainted with canonical texts. Yeah, good work, say, on the Satipatthana Sutta would be maybe the first work by Venerable Analio called, I think it's called The Direct Path to Realization which is a kind of exposition of the Satipatthana Sutta. Mm -hmm. And with that, that would be a good introductory work. Yeah, yeah. Though he's developed his thinking on Satipatthana repeatedly over the years, but I think that's a good introductory work on the topic. Okay, great. Thank you. So we want to respect uh, your time limit. Mm -hmm. And so the, our, our 30 minutes are up for the Q&A. So once again, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. for for joining us mm -hmm. and uh hopefully we'll get to speak again soon in the not too distant future okay thank you for the opportunity to bye mm -hmm. thank you so much venerable bodhi and corey for joining us today on behalf of pariyati i would like to thank all of you for attending this event as a small resource limited nonprofit organization we rely on volunteers to help us wherever possible and today's event would not have been possible without the generous support of both Tina Sabla and Chandragupta. Thanks again for your help. It is much appreciated as always. Thank you.